Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming to listen to today's discussion. B, I'm Erin Babson from Pew Campus Operations here downtown. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to point out a few highlights for the rest of the week's sustainability programs. First, there's a clipboard that's outside the doors out here for students. Please register your name there as that's where you'll be entered for prizes and giveaways for the end of the week at Laker Life Night. Your name will be entered to win and in the future you'll also receive information on sustainability for the campus. One award opportunity is for the best student campus sustainability idea. Out on the table out there is a large box and there's little cards if you want to fill out. If you have any ideas for sustainability in the future for the university or in general, the best idea will be given quite a big prize. I know they have quite a few different things, TVs and such like that. Throughout the week there are displays and exhibits at various campus locations both downtown and in Allendale. At the Kirkhoff Center on the second floor, there's a green residential living space set up to show you sustainable lifestyle products that you can do in your dorm room. We also have movement science display as well as healthy food options from the food service groups. In Kirkhoff, there's also exhibit tables from vendors and student groups as well. Today, downtown here, we have alternative vehicles using alternative fuels here outside in the courtyard starting at 1030 and then also in Allendale on Thursday. At Laker Life Night on Friday, in addition to the prizes and awards, there will be a fashion show, a Brazilian dance exhibition, and a student cook-off with prizes. So we encourage everyone to let others know and also for you to, to enjoy the week. At this time, I'm pleased to in introduce Dr. Jim Walter, who will be speaking on sustainable business development and your career path. Dr. Walter is a market, professor of marketing in the Seidman College of Business. In addition to his 25-year assignment at GVSU, Dr. Walter has taught physics and business courses as an adjunct professor at Purdue University, Central Michigan University, Indiana University, the University of Illinois, Michigan State University, and in General Electric's technical marketing program. Dr. Walter's current research and consulting interests are in new product market development, especially in energy co conversion products where businesses businesses, I'm sorry, where he has helped such per, per, firms such as Harding Energy, First Power, Plug Power, Capstone Turbine, Texaco, Avonic, and United Solar Systems develop and launch new products. There will be time to ask a few questions at the end of his presentation. Before he gets started, I would like to present a small token of our appreciation for taking part in Campus Sustainability Week. Thank you, Erin. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <coughs> And welcome to uh, a discussion of sustainability and why it's of interest to business folks in general. Um, first of all, let me talk about sustainability. I probably didn't get too interested in sustainability until I started having grandchildren. And I looked at them and I thought, well, what are they going to do for a job? Are they going to be able to breathe the air and swim in the water without getting sick? And there were some alarming things happening in terms of the environment and it caused me to become interested in the environment. Uh, I also began looking at what the economics of sustainability are and why it's of, of importance to business people in general and I began looking at jobs pictures and what's happening in, in our country in particular and of course worldwide with respect to in, employment patterns and I began to see a relationship between the concept of sustainability and the concept of long-term economic survival and growth. And I also began to look at a third world which is emerging and is emerging fast. As a matter of fact, you folks, students of your age and, and your generation, will live through the most profound expansion in business that this planet has ever seen. It's going to be the third world development. It's going to be spurred by the internet, which number one is, I call it the great expectation machine, you turn on your internet machine, you look at it, and you see things that come from the advanced world, and guess what? You'll want them. And that's what marketing is about. It's about finding out how these emerging patterns of demand create business opportunities. And of course, the converse side of that is how do we create businesses which support the flow of goods and services to this emerging sector, which is going to emerge in light speed. The Chinese economy, for example, right now is growing at 12% per year compound. And that's accelerating, not reducing. There are almost 2 billion people in China who want what you have and want it not necessarily tomorrow, but within their lifetime. And they're working very hard to see that that happens. 
Combine China and India together and you have half of the world's population and half of the emerging demand for the products, goods, and services that we take for granted in the advanced industrialized economies, but which in fact are not available yet, but coming soon. As a matter of fact, many products have already made it soon. China is the largest cell phone market in the world, largest bicycle market in the world. It has an emerging automobile economy, which is seen basically to be equal to the Detroit or U.S. auto production system, which is around 16 or 17 million vehicles, probably by 2015. And so, in order to supply this, these kinds of products, and more importantly, the fuels that make them go, we have to look at basically our supply systems and what's happening to them. So when we talk about sustainability, I want to emphasize the business side of sustainability. I'm not an environmental scientist. I am an economist, trained economist. I am an engineer and physicist and trained product development person. But my real love is marketing, which is putting all these things together, obviously, to create a pattern of growth in terms of our economy. Let me talk about sustainability. Um, great buzzwords come and go. Sustainability is definitely there. It's on everyone's lips. It's on the largest corporation leaders' lips. It's on the highest government officials' lists. It's on the list of, of basically the same folks all around the world are all talking about sustainability for a very good reason. There are many things that we do that we have depended upon for our own futures and, and, and our own sustenance which in fact use non-sustainable practices because they either pollute the environment or they're using resources which are not replenished and of course will be exhausted at some point in the future or because they simply are a poor use of resources and have no return path in terms of reusing those resources in what we call reverse marketing channels or bringing things back for recycling and reuse again. And there are some excellent examples of people who are moving in directions to solve those problems. At Steelcase, a new line of chairs, for example, is 99% recyclable. When people are done using it in an office space, it can come back and become a child's toy, an appliance. It can become automotive plastics. But it's recyclable to, to the 99% level. And those are just some things we'll begin talking about this morning in terms of what our final goals are in terms of maintaining a recyclable and renewable economy so that we in fact are not running into these problems that we have seen uh, in our environment and in our economic systems. Now the roots of sustainability, where, where this term comes from, comes principally from an environmental movement started by Amory Lovins and, and founded by many others at the Rocky Mountain Institute. We began seeing concerns about sustainability as far back as Rachel, Rachel Carlson's book which was called Silent Spring and talked about the environmental consequences of continuing to mismanage our ecosphere or our ecosystem in, this, in, in our world. Uh, but the three things that are concerned in, in sustainability are the environment, uh, economics, and equity, meaning social justice in terms of how our business systems create patterns of social justice, sustainability in terms of you wanting to go to the job that you have every day, and of course, as I said, finding a job for these eight wonderful grandchildren I have. And I keep looking, and I've been looking for the last decade or so, for those answers. Where will my grandchildren work? And where will you work? Because you're in another generation, obviously, coming into, into the world of work. So this is called the, the, the triple bottom line. Uh, it's been named by architect Bill McDonough, who is a proponent of this and of course one of one of the chief disciples who is has just written a book called from cradle to cradle and from cradle to cradle talks about taking products from their beginning phases through an entire process whereby they would have useful life as a product and then returning them back to a cradle for a new stream of products uh, we heard all through the 1990s about something called cradle to grave managing products from their inception to their use to their final destroy it, uh, destruction or landfill use or whatever you want to call it. But cradle to cradle went one step further and said, okay, if we're done using this product, whether it's an automobile, an appliance, uh, even perhaps buildings, is there some way that we can in fact reuse these products and thereby reduce the amount of load that we're putting on some limited resources as far as the way we are using the, the Earth's resources? 
So uh, Bill McDonough is, uh, is a leader. You'll find his book, Cradle to Cradle. Uh, and you can Google and pick up most of the stuff, I think, actually online today. So this is where sustainability comes from. Campus sustainability here at Grand Valley has taken an approach looking at the way we use energy in our architectural use. Uh, it has led us, for example, to look at the way energy is used uh, in general. And many, about four years ago, I got involved in a project which is in Muskegon called Merrick, Michigan Alternative Renewable Energy Center. The Michigan Alternative Renewable Energy Center was meant to be a demonstration for how renewable energy products could power a building. Powering the building meaning that it required no external source of power in order to maintain its daily activities. And I'll just talk a brief, brief moment about the things that go on there so that you can get a picture for how energy systems relate to sustainability. This building is sustainable as long as the sun shines and as long as clouds don't impede the sun from, from hitting the, the building operation. What you'll find in this building is a roof, thank you, this is on top, uh, for which it has a zebra stripe look to it, but in fact is 256 of these which is a Michigan-made product which creates electricity when the sun shines on it. How much electricity? Well, the roof of that building makes 33 kilowatts. It's a 24,000 square foot building. A good rule of architecture is to have roughly a kilowatt per square per thousand square feet. So in fact, we've you know, more than exceeded with the likely demands for, for that building use just from the power of the sun. Now, we weren't content to deal with just the power of the sun because the, it was an energy research center. We were looking for other ways to test and evaluate various energy products as they were coming on the marketplace. So this building also features a fuel cell. You know, a fuel cell is a device that is a clean energy machine. Basically, this one runs on natural gas, but you're probably aware all fuel cells actually work on the simple element hydrogen. And this, in, in this particular case, this very large box, most of the box is taking natural gas and pulling the hydrogen away from it so the fuel cell system actually works. But this, too, is enough power to run the building. Now, again, it does require natural gas as a feedstock, but instead of burning it in a furnace or a boiler, it chemically reacts it to create water and electricity and essentially no, no pollution is what I'm trying to say. Uh, very little carbon dioxide, actually none of the things which we call SOX rocks or NOx, sulfur dioxide, uh, carbon particulate from utility systems which burn coal, and uh, of course all the carbon dioxide which comes off. Now carbon dioxide is, is a relatively innocuous thing, we thought. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is the source of life for plant life. Plants, as you know from your biology class, take in carbon dioxide. The photosynthesis process creates sugars from that, which again are used in the plant to make the stalk, the fiber, the cellulose. And the wonderful plant turns out oxygen, so it's a great chemical plant. Uh, but let me tell you something about the efficiency of using photosynthesis to make our fuel sources. Everything that we burn or use in making fuel sources around the world basically was living matter at one time or another. It, it was in the carbon cycle. Now, in order to get oil to run our cars with, with gasoline or diesel fuel, we have to basically create layers and layers of this over millions of years, pack it deeply in the Earth's crust, and it turns into oil in some magic ways that I'm not quite sure how they work, but there are these pools of oil. And the pools of oil have, of course, created what we know of as the 20th and 21st century economic boom. In other words, our economy has been powered by oil, has been powered by gas, has been powered by gasoline and natural gas. All of these fuels which make our economy run are in fact limited in terms of the amount that are there and they're not being replaced. It takes millions of years for the sun to shine on a leaf, for the leaf to fall to the ground, for enough leaves to collect to turn into a pool of oil or gas or coal or whatever. And of course, when we use those up in 100 years or 200 years, we basically have eliminated that as a potential source of fuel. So we need to look for ways that we can have the energy that we need for our economic systems 
without depleting the resources that are both precious, scarce, and, and being depleted. Are we really worried about depleting oil? It depends on who you read. If you read the disciples of King Hubert, who was one of the, the world's most respected geologists, uh, he says that we are peak, at, at peak oil somewhere around the year 2012. Now, peak oil doesn't mean oil goes away, but it means there is a bell-shaped curve of supply, and we're going to be at the top of that bell-shaped curve somewhere around 2012. And yes, it may take 50 or 75 or 100 years to go down that other side of that curve, but guess what? There's more and more competition, more demand. We're now pumping 100 million barrels a day of oil, which is a lot of oil. And so that curve goes down a very slippery slope, meaning it gets more expensive. It gets more like something you'd go to war for in order to maintain. And it gets more like something that is basically going to be allocated based upon either economic resources, meaning the prices are going to go higher and higher, uh, or we're going to have more and more conflict in terms of who gets their share. So if we really are forward thinking, we begin to look at ways to say, are there some replacements for the fuel sources that we're using? And many of you have heard about many of these replacements, and I want to just address a few of them today and talk about the likelihood of these things being um, coming to an economic reality anytime soon. Let me start with this one. Electricity generation uh, is responsible for business, as is transportation. Excuse me. As a matter of fact, if you plot the line of economic growth of any economy in the world, especially since the 1800s when the Industrial Revolution hit and machines began turning using electricity, you will find a one-for-one -one correspondence between the economic growth, in, measured as gross domestic product, and the amount of energy that's consumed in that economy. It's very hard to get away from that, because as I make more products, I use more, more electricity and more fuel to distribute them. And so there is always this correspondence between economic growth and energy use, but guess what? It's accelerating now in this beginning of this millennium towards the use of more and more electricity per person. Why is that? Well, people are plugging in 300 watt computers and instead of using a 75 watt light bulb to work at their desk, they're using a 300 watt computer. It's interesting that, that what has happened, especially in major cities, is that there is a shortage of electricity. Uh, before the unfortunate tragedy of 9-11, of uh, two elevator shafts in the Twin Towers had been closed down, gutted, the elevators taken out, and more electric cabling was run up to the high floors because when the building was designed by the architects, this is true of the Sears Tower, especially true of the Empire State Building, it's true of almost any high rise in any place in the country. Nobody ever figured that people were gonna come in and have at their desk a workstation. There was never en enough electric power put in to do that. And so we have this constraint. As a matter of fact, if you go and lease space, office space in the Sears Tower, uh, you are restricted above the 60th floor in terms of how many workstations you can plug in. And the rents get cheaper because you're you know, not getting the privilege of having all of the work potential that you wanted to plug in there. So we need ways of looking at, A, how do I either reduce the demand for electricity on a per person basis? And that's an exceedingly interesting and, and important thing to be looking at. And, the, and, and fortunately, there are some wonderful technologies coming along that are, are allowing us to do that. Not the least of which is this laptop, which is here. This laptop uses less than a fifth of the electricity that a tower computer uses with all of its little flies buzzing around inside of it, whatever goes on. So that's an example of, of a way to reduce electricity. Lighting efficiency, I don't know how many of you have seen the little curly Q light bulbs. They use about a fifth of the electricity and make as much light because they're a fluorescent technology, not a hot filament, which is something that is, of course, burning at very high temperatures, thank you to Mr. Edison and his crew. So lighting efficiency, uh, insulation for heat, re retention in buildings, comfort controls in terms of less expensive heating and air conditioning, all of these things are being worked on. We call that demand side management. In other words, looking at what is hooked up to the electric system and being able to reduce that demand uh, through new technology. As we know, LEDs, light emitting diodes, 
are using approximately one hundredth of what is used to make these lights work, which are shining on me on this stage right now. They're not quite there in terms of color or cost, but there is so much work going on and, and so much new business coming along that the cost of these things are being driven down. Uh, we, we have done some lighting development where we use arrays or multiple LEDs in systems. Two years ago, we were paying 71 cents per LED and putting 20 or 30 or 40 into a, an array so that we could create a large pattern of light. We just recently got quotations, and of course from the Far East, three and a half cents a piece. And this is in two years, dropping from 70 cent range to the three cent range in two years. And this is not atypical. Any time that a product has been brought into mass production, we find ways to reduce the per unit cost of making products. Bill Gates has often been quoted as having said, if we could make an automobile with as much cost reduction in the automobile as we've had in computing, meaning on a per bit handling basis, as we went from 16K memory computers to 16 gig memory computers, he said a new car would cost $2. Well, of course, he's making a point about the efficiency of the manufacturing system going into extremely high volume and the fact that there are essentially low-cost materials once you get the system running and the capital investment for the machines to make it. Let me give you an example of how that applies to making electricity. This product here, let me get something that's easier to pick up. This is the very same material, cut into a smaller piece. There's a uh, little stainless steel, which is very thin, half the thickness of a human hail, hair, carrier, which runs through a robot. The robot is a football field long. It makes a material that is this width. This panel here recharges a solar lantern. There's been 10,000 of these made and sent around the world most of them to developing countries where people have been spending, well, they used to spend four, five, and six dollars per month for kerosene. Now it's twenty dollars a month per kerosene with the increase in fuel costs over the past decade. Guess what this lantern costs? To operate, it requires you to put this in the sunshine in the daytime so the lantern recharges. That's what it costs. We sold a bunch of these to the Amish farmers down in Indiana. and I had, I had an interesting experience uh, I went down to this Amish hardware store called Eash, E-A-S-H, Sales, in Shipshawana, Indiana. And Jay Eash, who runs the thing, had been stocking and selling our lantern. I, I say our lantern. It was made by Light Corporation of Grand Haven, Michigan, a business example of taking renewable products and creating a business out of it. Uh, he said, I'm having trouble selling these lanterns. And he said, I can't remember his name. Let me call him Luke for a moment bearded farmer is over there looking at lanterns and he said he was asking me questions about it. I'm glad you're in town. Would you please explain it to him and why he should spend $99 for it? So I went over and got introduced to this man and he said, uh, yes, he said, I use a light every night. I have to go out and make sure that, that the animals are bedded down. He said in the middle of the night, I use it to go to the outhouse. He said, you know, it's important for me to have light. And I said, well, how do you get light now? And he said, from this and he picked up a Coleman lantern, which was $29. He said, why would I spend $99 for your product when I can buy this for $29? And I looked at it, and I was struggling for an answer, and I had this insight, and I said to him, well, what does this lantern cost? He said, $29. I said, no, 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 what does it cost you to run? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, what makes it go? He said, well, batteries, of course. And I said, well, what do they cost? Well, he said, they're right over here. And he picked up an eight pack of D cell batteries, which was eight dollars. And I said, Well, I said, how often do you replace them? He said, You know, actually, I don't know. He seems like quite often. And he got the box out from the Coleman lantern, and it said right on there, last approximately eight hours on a single set of batteries. Now that probably got him through two or three or four weeks, once a month, I'm not sure. And uh, I said to him, Well, now, how much does this lantern cost? He said, oh, I get it, a dollar an hour. I said, yeah. I said, how much does this lantern cost? He said, well, 
After 99 days of use, it's free, isn't it? I said, yeah, it's not just free. It pays you a dollar in order to own it. He bought three of them and walked out of the store. You know? So if you can sell an old Amishman you know, who's very tight with a buck, you, know, you, you can do a lot of things. Well, this machine, as I'm talking about here, is coming close to Grand Rapids. How many people, just for the sake of it, have seen United Solar in the news lately in Greenville, Michigan? Anybody here? A few of us. Let me make a quick explanation to tell you something that isn't necessarily described in the literature that we see in the newspaper. This material starts out as a one and a half mile long roll of stainless steel. There are six of those rolls in one machine. They all run parallel together through these depositing chambers where this photoactive material is deposited on using something called plasma deposition, which is way beyond any of our understanding at this point, but it's a pretty little blue light that comes out of the chambers. You, know, you can watch that. All of the coatings which make this thing turn into an electric generator are less than a millionth of an inch thick, all build up on here. Now, I tell you, if you take any material in the world and slice it down into millionth of an inch thick sections, and put it on something to use it, you have very low cost. As a matter of fact, these materials are so low cost, they're far cheaper than anything that goes into a Silicon Valley based chip. This is amorphous silicone, meaning it's random, disoriented, has no structure. It's like beach sand, a little more pure than that, but it doesn't come from the same sources of material that are used to make chips for Intel. This comes from a material that is actually a floral silicate gas, which is in abundance. We have no problem finding the material. Now this wonderful machine, several machines, there are actually now eight of them going into the city of Greenville. In 50 hours, 48 hours, something like that, will make, each machine makes nine linear miles of this material. So that's 36 miles in 50 hours. In a week, you're talking more than 100 miles of this stuff right here. And so this is a revolution. This is in Michigan. This is creating jobs. How many jobs might it create? Well, let me tell you what we think the future of this business is as one example of a sustainable industry. Why sustainable? Because as long as the sun shines, this material works. What is its life? We don't know. We've been installing this material since 1987. Those systems, nearing 20 years old, are working just as well as the day we put them in. So we don't know what the life is. There's no easy way to do accelerated life tests on this kind of material. But it might last 50 years. It might last 100 years. It might be your lifetime investment for making electricity on your home. Unfortunately, most people don't stay in the same home for that many years. But it should enhance the value of your home in terms of selling it to somebody else because guess what? You've got a house that doesn't have a utility bill if you have this material on your roof. So let's look for a moment at a couple of options here. I'm going to stay in this mode here. Um, according to industry sources, worldwide sales for, and this is not the only material in the world. As a matter of fact, this company is just kind of an emerging company. They're just coming onto the scene but they happen to be coming onto the scene with something that is the least expensive, lightest weight, and perhaps most durable solution. Everybody else makes a glass sandwiched solar panel, which is heavy and uses very expensive chips, which are individually wired together. This robot makes 100 miles of this material in a week. So we're talking about some radically different approaches to cost, production, and durability of products. Uh, industry sales forecast for next year will be $27 billion. Now again, if you look at the last seven years average, we've had 44.5% compound growth in sales in photovoltaic materials. That's accelerating, not declining. Governor Schwarzenegger of California just signed a bill in the last three months authorizing and funding, and funding, one million solar roofs in the state of California. As a matter of fact, according to California law now, if you were building a new home, you have to take a architectural plan which shows the roof being solar and sign off on it that you don't want it. 
Now, I don't know why you wouldn't want it because there are companies that are financing these in California right now that will say to you, here's a bonded, licensed you know, agreement between you and I that if you include the cost of this roof in your mortgage, your payments on your mortgage will be less than if you took the mortgage without it and added a utility bill to it. So you're going to save money. Plus, you're going to save the environment. Plus, you're going to save the California electric system, which is what the real objective of the program is. So it's a $27 billion industry now. Modest, modest size, not too bad. Look what happens, the, the marvel of compounding. If we retain just the 44.5% growth, by 2010, we're talking about a $72 billion industry, roughly the size of Boeing Corporation. That's interesting, isn't it? If you go to 2015, you're looking at $485 billion, which is the combined sales of the big three automakers here in the state of Michigan. Even more interesting, half a trillion dollars. If you push these numbers, and what's going to push the numbers? India, China, Africa. If you push these numbers into 2020, you're looking at, you know, divide it by three because I'm overly exuberant or something, a trillion dollar industry. How many trillion dollar industries are you familiar with? Now this one is not headquartered in Michigan, but the most improved technology and the likely winner in a long-term race of cost, efficiency, and, and ease of application happens to be resident in our state of Michigan. And so that's kind of an interesting fact to look at what could be an extremely important industry, just one piece of sustainability. And this is what sustainability means. It means having a long-term future, which doesn't depend upon depleting resources, which grows, and basically which is sustainable, and that's where the word sustainable comes from. Some very large corporations are picking up on the mantra of sustainability. Uh, I didn't have time to put them on the internet, but, or I mean on, on my picture here, but let me show you one that you're all familiar with. Uh, here is New York Times, October 21st, which is last Saturday. Companies find risk-free way to adopt solar power. Here's a General Motors roof in California. It's got one and a half megawatts or one and a half million watts generating capacity of this material, and it didn't cost GM anything, zero, because a company called Sun Edison is doing the capital installation and then charging GM a rate for power, which is less than you would pay off the grid. You know what you're going to pay in California now for level five grid power, which means you've used more than 20 kilowatts at any instant? They're watching you every millisecond. There's a machine there that talks to the computer down at uh, PG&E. 60 cents a kilowatt hour if you're a large user of electricity. Oh, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? When we're here in the state of Michigan protected paying eight or nine, or is it really eight or nine in Michigan? Who, who can quote me a utility bill that you've seen lately in terms of what you're paying per power? Well, look at your utility bill. It's got all kinds of adders on them, about six in a row. Things we call securitization, which is to pay our utility companies for the price of deregulation. Oh, yes, we are going to deregulate electric utilities. California has done it. Texas has done it. Nevada has done it. New Jersey has done it. Chicago, as an island, is thinking about doing it. Mary George Hartwell in the city of Grand Rapids wants 20% of the city's power to come from renewable sources by the year 2008. So Grand Rapids is going to do it. Just saying, this, this is a movement that has already gained the kind of momentum that's coming down the hill very fast and growing. So here's a General Motors plant putting this material, actually, same material that you're seeing laying here on the floor. Uh, I've been helping a young company get up, get roots, get started. We finally told them Michigan is no place to do it. Move your operation to California, which they did about a year ago. They now have five, I think, jobs uh, that they're quoting to the major refinery of Chevron Corporation because Chevron put up 500,000 or a half a megawatt of this material three years ago at one of the refineries. They're so impressed with the savings that they've had on their electric bill that they've got five of their refineries and they're saying, Oh, well, don't make it a half a megawatt. Make it a full megawatt so we can double our savings. And so here's this one little group of people that were, were actually were incubator clients up at the Merrick Center. 
that we kind of pushed off after two years and said, okay, you know, you, you're incubated. You should go out and do some real business now. They went to California, and they're starting to do megawatt class jobs because California is a hot market for this product. Now, would Michigan be a hot market for the product? Well, let me just tell you that we get about 70% of the benefit on an annual basis of this product that you would get in Florida or California or Texas, where there is, obviously, a lot more sun, especially at this time of the year. But it doesn't mean it doesn't work. This material is the best material in low light that's out there. So on a day like today, it would be making power. If you went up to the Merrick Center today, its 33 kilowatt roof would probably be making five or six, and it's a cloudy day. And so it does make some power, it just doesn't make the power that it would make if it were setting in, in the beautiful sunshiny hills of Southern California or something like that. Uh, General Electric Company has introduced a plan they call Echo Imagination. Echo Imagination, again, is the, a declaration by one of the world's most successful companies that there is a way to make money while being environmentally sound. Jeffrey Immelt, the ch new chairman and, and CEO of, of General Electric Company, has increased spending on Echo Imagination projects, which include wind, solar, geothermal, biomass, clean coal, did I miss anything, and fuel cells to one and a half billion dollars per year. Now this comes from a company that had basically pared away its R&D budgets under the reign of Jack Welch. Sure, Jack Welch was very, very financially successful, but guess what? If you took my marketing class, you would see that he was running all of his businesses in late maturity, which means what? Profits are very skinny unless you're very large, but guess what? Your market begins to go away as new technologies come on. And so now Jeffrey Immelt, taking control of the reins of this huge corporate giant, is saying, well, we better reinvest in some R&D or our future businesses are not going to be as strong as they could be, and a major portion of that R&D budget goes into sustainable technologies particularly energy technologies, because General Electric is, of course, an energy company. Uh, do I believe these numbers? Uh, as I said, cut it back by two-thirds and, and just define for me a trillion-dollar industry, I'll be happy. So what does this mean for Michigan jobs? If that 2020 thing happened, that you, Someone once said, if you follow anyone's presentation, you'll find spelling errors somewhere. And uh, I think that's what that is. <laughs> if you went back and looked at that tremendously large dollar number uh, and said, OK, uh, just assume, and, and this is a good number going forward, that we were talking about $5 per watt to install that $3 trillion worth of stuff, right? We would be making 507 gigawatts of material. Now, watch the bouncing ball. I'm just talking about practicality of the vision and the model and seeing it come to pass. That meant if we were using those machines that made that material there, it would take 19,000 of those machines over the next 13 years. And that's fairly aggressive. That's not likely to happen. But what is happening is they're finding ways to improve the efficiency of each one of those machines. As they improve the efficiency of each one of those machines, it makes more and more material per machine. And I'm going, OK, I watch all of this happen. I know the science, a little bit about it. I know the scientists. I've been working with this company since the late 1980s. I'm very familiar with, with the, the skills and the technology and the advances, the leap forwards that they've made. I'm saying, well, let me just assume that they can uh, make a five times improvement, which I think is very realistic. It's like taking Henry Ford's Model T engine and saying, well, I, can I get five times more horsepower out of a gasoline engine? And the answer is, yeah, we've managed to get about 50 times more if you look at some of the new GTOs and things that are out there now. So I'm saying, let's just be conservative. Give me a five times improvement. I would thereby have to make 300 machines per year. Mr. F Fry, could that be done? Yeah. The machine is a complicated process. The very inventions are, are themselves state of the art. Uh, but they have dramatically increased the production, to your point. It has doubled over the last two years in terms of the capacity each machine can produce. 
That's right. Is it possible? Yes, but a substantial investment too. That's what we're about, is making investments for the future and attracting capital so that the businesses that we create create jobs, create improvements in health and environment, create long-term sustainability in our world. And let me tell you something. If we hadn't spent $300 billion fighting a war in the Middle East to keep our oil flowing, what would we, how many machines would we have from that? I mean, you do the math at $60 million a piece. But what happens to the $60 million price tag as you begin making now 10 in a run, now 20, now 30, now 50? And the answer is that comes tumbling down because every machine is like the one before it, except we want to begin to add improvements to it as it goes. The marvel of production, which we have seen in 200 years, and especially in electronics, applies to this. Bill Gates' observation that a car should cost $2 means that those machines should cost somewhere around $15 million. I mean, I have every confidence that they'll eventually get there as we find the capacity, roll out the markets, accelerate the growth. And so this is one example that I wanted to bring before you today. And if I don't stop talking about this, I'm going to run you out of time because I did want a question and answer period, and I know that you guys have another class to go to. Professor Fry. Just one other to support your point. The cost per machine in that same two-year period um, dropped from 80 to just under 60 million. And that's just the first drop. Yeah, the product demand, let me tell you about the product demand. Uh, the person who wrote Cradle to Cradle, Bill McDonough, I had lunch with him two years ago, and he, said, he calls me the solar guy because he knows I'm interested in all this. And there were about eight people around the table, and he said, he said, Jim, you would be interested in a project I've just undertaken. I said, yes. He said, I just came back from China, where Madam Deng, who is the highest female in Chinese government, she's the equivalent of uh, Minister of the Interior, I think, or something like that, has convened a panel of world-class experts, which Bill McDonough is one, of course, and about 15 others, social planners, urban planners, scientists, architects, whatever. He said that she sat us down and said to us, I want you people with your world-class experience and knowledge of all things diverse and interesting to help me with a problem that I have. I have been challenged by our high government to do a 50-year plan in the country of China. She said, we've been famous for our five-year leap ahead plans, but this is a 50-year plan. She said, I have been challenged with building in the next 50 years 400 million private residences in the country of China. Now, we have a country of 300 million people and maybe 120 million homes. In the next 50 years, China wants to build 400. And she said, he said, Bill McDonough, the reason you'll be interested in this is because she has already concluded they have to be solar powered. There is no other way to do it. We've got one Twin Gorges project. We've got coal soot laying all over everything. You have to wear a wet handkerchief over your mouth walking in the streets of Beijing. They have to be solar powered. Guess what? You know, this 2020 demand I'm talking about here, about three-fourths of it would come from a 400 million home project in the country of China. So this is real. This is possible. This is more than possible. This is a vision of the future as I see it. Questions? Yes? Yes. Uh, other panels are rated at higher efficiencies, meaning, and this is a, something you have to be very careful of, they're always rated at 20 degrees C, in full sun, which only happens at solar noon on the equator. And so they'll say, well, we're 18% efficient, whereas this is 9% efficient. So we're therefore twice as efficient as you are. The problem is, when they heat up, their efficiency drops. So if you put them in a hot part of the world, and remember this, the potential for solar is infinity times infinity. Plus or minus 15 degrees of the equator where the sun shines lives two-thirds of the world's population. And guess what? They don't have electricity. You can take this material, you can put it on a high mountaintop in, in, in the Urals, the Andes, uh, in the Himalayas. You can aim it towards the sun. You can charge 
another Michigan product called a nickel metal hydride battery, which is a lifetime battery. I mean, this battery right here will run a workstation and a few other things in your office all day long from solar power. That student can aim an antenna to an orbiting satellite or a geostationary satellite and pick up a feed from Grand Valley State University's distance education program and pick up a master's degree from Grand Valley. Well, maybe Grand Valley is not quite there yet, but guess who is? Duke University's Fuqua School of Management has an online distance education program for an MBA. And when I heard about it about 10 years ago, I called and I talked to the director. I said, well, if I get a distance MBA from Duke University, does it say MBA at a distance? He says, no. It says Duke University Fuqua School of Management MBA. So I can get this in the Sahara Desert. I can get this in, in the southern plains of Brazil. I can get this any place the sun shines. And it is going to revolutionize the way information travels the world. Because I can now put power wherever I need information. I can put power wherever I need power. Yes? Are you still relying on fossil fuels for shipping? Yes. Are you Very, very good question. Because the business model, incidentally, this company is run by Robert Stemple, who used to be the chairman and CEO of General Motors Corporation. Very, very savvy engineer, a very good executive. And he has decided with his staff that this technology should stay in A, in the United States, and principally, at least in its launch phases, in Michigan. Because their scientists want to work with the machines and want to make sure everything is working. So contrary to what we're reading in the newspaper, what is being made in Greenville, Michigan, is actually the substrate converted into a photovoltaic material, but it's a raw material product that will be shipped around the world to points where people will finish the product by putting on the laminations, the pickup wires and grids. And in other words, it's great hand labor. And it's a good thing to send to a low-cost labor market. So we retain the technology in Michigan. We make the fundamental core material here in Michigan, keep the intellectual property in the state of Michigan, do the scientific development in the state of Michigan, and export the value of the product to markets where, in fact, it will create local businesses for people who are doing solar development around the world. And yes, it will use conventional fuels to ship, as we understand them today. But ocean freight's pretty cheap. It's the cheapest. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. When I say working grade, I mean tested to make what the label said it should make 20 years ago. It's still making today. So it hasn't lost anything. That's the important. As far as the integrity of the roof, it depends on what's under the roof more than what's on top. And, uh, and I have a Florida home, incidentally, and I've been doing hurricane repairs down there. This year I didn't have to, but the past two years we had substantial hurricane repairs to do. But let me tell you, this material uh, has been rated in Dade County, Miami, Florida, which is now 150 mile an hour wind loads. But, uh, but as long as the sub roof stays in place, this will not, it's a peel and stick with a urethane adhesive on it, it stays down. I invite you to drive by, incidentally, uh, Aquinas College, go down Robinson Road, look at what is called the Jarecki Center. That roof has been up since 1999, so it's approaching its seventh year. And it's on an architectural standing seam roof, which is a steel roof. And that is the highest strength rated roof. As far as insulating properties, that's always under the shingles anyhow. So I'm just saying you put the same insulation in you put in a roof now. Professor Fry. One of the really exciting features of this product is that it does ship so easily that you can roll it up just like roll paper. Yep. Unlike the silicon based stiff solar panels that are big and heavy and delicate.
So you export it to the utility. Uh, another Michigan product from the same company, the same inventive mind, a genius who for 45 years has labored tirelessly and not necessarily in obscurity, he's managed to attract attention, but their company is just now getting into the commercial phase. We've helped them the past six, seven years raise nearly $900 million of capital. We've helped them form partnerships with names that you would recognize, Intel, Samsung, General Electric, Chevron Corporation, Texaco, uh, well, Beckert, uh, Cannon Corporation. I'm just saying all of this has been taking this treasure trove of nearly a thousand patents and saying, okay, there's some commercial value here. And that's what I do best, is help people find commercial markets for things that are inventive and novel and solve significant problems, but for which they have not found their way to the market yet. That's why I'm a marketing professor. This is a Michigan product. Six of these go into a Saturn View, Saturn View Hybrid, which is coming out about mid-year 2007. Just six of these make it a hybrid automobile. This is a nickel metal hydride battery. 1,600 of them go into a General Electric 207-ton locomotive, you know, the head engine with the diesel electric locomotive, and turn it into a hybrid, mo elect uh, hybrid locomotive which is supposed to get a 15% fuel savings, which turns into, if the railroad industry would use it, something of the order of reducing about five or eight million barrels of oil a day, which is used in the transportation sector. So I'm saying there's some, some real power to add to the life cycle of our fossil fuels, and of course reduce the pollution levels that are coming from them. Hybrid cars make less than a tenth of the pollution of a regular car. I'm talking now about a Toyota Prius. Yes. This is a battery so that it charges. It can charge from your wall circuit. It can charge from the sun. It can charge from a bicycle with a generator on it. I'm saying any source of electricity will be stored in here and become usable later. Yes. That's right. Exactly right. Yes. Yes, uh, no I don't because nobody's worn one of these out either. Uh, General Motors spent nearly $400 million developing this for the electric. I, I recommend, really, it's going to come out in February in, in C DVD. I recommend a movie called Who Killed the Electric Car? It just played over at our art theater here about three weeks ago or something like that. But this was Stemple's project at GM and that's why he went to work for this company. And what they didn't tell you meaning you, the public, was that the GM, the GM01, which was called the EV1, the first electric car, would get, with these batteries in it, would get 200 mile range. If you go to a website and look at the EV1, it says it gets 80 miles range and then it's tired and needs recharged. That's true if you have lead acid batteries in it. They never told the public because they didn't want to go ahead with the program how good this system was. Um, there's a, there's a company call, uh, in, in, out in Boston making electric cars. They have, get, have gotten 400 mile range out of the same battery systems, yes? So the batteries we're producing for the general motor vehicle are not traditionally guaranteed Well, the last time I heard Bob Stemple talk about it, he said 600,000, so yeah. 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 Just really don't know. We haven't worn them out yet. And again, they need to be properly maintained and cared for and everything else. But I know when I was helping GM with this back, and, and, and I took this battery to General Electric's fuel cell division, which is called Plug Power Corporation. They're in Latham, New York. As soon as they saw how good it was, they adopted it uniformly. Unfortunately, their business model hasn't been so successful. Don't buy any Plug Power stock. It's had its run, and, and now it's in trouble. So don't buy that. And uh, but But... General Motors at that time had tested batteries 220,000 cycles and stopped the test. They weren't seeing degradation in the battery. And they figured, boy, that's enough. You know, that'll get you down the road. And so we don't have to do any more testing on that. So it's a very robust system. That is a hydrogen-based battery. It has water inside of it. Electricity splits water. 
The negative electrode holds hydrogen ions. The positive electrode holds what we call hydroxyls, OHs. That's a nickel oxyhydroxide. When you want electricity, they come together on the separator strip that's between them, like a fuel cell, make electricity, and turn back into water. Split water, make water. Split water, make water. Drive your car, charge your car. That's the way it works. So pretty slick systems and Michigan-based technologies here in our state. James Eppolito, the new, new president and CEO of our Michigan Economic Development Corporation, has called Michigan the new Silicon Valley because we can see growth in some of these products that perhaps will exceed the expectations of the Intels and AMDs and whatever, and it will be in the photovoltaics industry. Last year was a watershed year. More silicon went into photovoltaic products than went into computer chips, and that's a watershed year because photovoltaics is growing faster than computer chips, and it will for the next 50 years. Any other questions? Okay, I've held you guys over time. Thank you very much. I'll stay here uh, to answer anything that you might have afterwards. And that's the name of that tune.